Hello, welcome back to our series, Behind the Scenes of Nautilus. I'm Commander Brad Boyd, Director of Submarine Force Museum and Officer in Charge of Storage Ship Nautilus. This episode, we're going into the bridge. Now, I'm actually gonna start on the pier. Uh, we'll kind of time warp away from this, go to the pier, and I'm gonna give you an explanation of what all the masts are going from fore to aft or right to left on your screen. Um, and then uh, we'll time warp back to this spot and we'll go straight up into the bridge. So if you have any questions, please let us know. But with that, on with the tour. All right, so before we get started, uh, this is gonna be harder to see once we're in the bridge, all the individual masts, I'll code down which, which one's which uh, from down here. So the very first one you see has the amber light on top, the amber glass on top. That's the uh, navigation ID beacon. So submarines don't exactly conform with rules of the road. Um, any vessel over 50 meters in length is required to have two masthead lights uh, viewable from uh, what, 225 degrees uh, uh, around. So we can't meet that condition just based off the, the you know, the layout of the boat. There's only a couple of spots we can have the mass. Um, so we don't conform with that. We have a known exception for that policy, or for that rule. And then we also have that navigation beacon to help other ships identify that, hey, this is something weird out here. I need to look a little bit closer at that. And that's that amber light that you see on top. And what we do is we had that flash. It goes flash, 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 and then it's off for a little bit. Then flash, 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 and then off for like a second or two. Um, and what that does is that flash, flash, flash is Morse code for S, or submarine, um, and so that's an authorization we have from the Department of Defense to deviate. Next back, you see the lines going up to it, that's the flag staff. So when you're flying the flag from the bridge, that's where it would fly from. Back from that is the uh, Type 8B, 8 Bravo periscope, that's the navigation scope. So it has a little bit of radio uh, capabilities inside of it, and it also has a little bit of uh, ESM, electronic uh, surveillance measurements, um, excuse me, electronic support measurements uh, uh, capability in that. Back from that is the Type 2 Foxtrot Periscope. That's the attack scope, the number uh, two scope. So it, all it is is optics. There's nothing else in there besides that. Um, and it doesn't have as much zoom capability as the number one scope as we talked about before. Back from that, um, you actually have a retractable, um, actually, I'm sorry, one back from that, the really thin mass, I should talk about that first. So the one really, really thin next to the uh, number one scope that's actually the uh, emergency whip antenna. So that way you can transmit medium and high frequency uh, uh, from that one. But that, that's emergency whip antenna really can only be used while surface have been back for at periscope depth. But that's what that is. All right, now further back. So we got one that's got a horizontal uh, piece to it. That's the radar mass, talk about that in a second. And then the one further back sipping up above that is actually the uh, BRA-9, the BRA-9. So it's a retractable antenna, obviously. Uh, but it's for medium and high frequency radio, uh, radio. Then you have the radar antenna right there, so uh, used on the surface uh, or, or broached. Um, and what that does is lets you uh, uh, obviously send radi radar out, uh, detect surface ships, low flying aircraft. Um, you can use that for navigation uh, against land uh, uh, returns, as well as uh, surface uh, contact management. And you can even use it for fire control. You can tie the solutions into your fire control system if you're gonna eng engage from the surface. All right, back from that, so you've got two more masts. One kind of has a flat top, and the other one's got a series of uh, uh, black domes and, and segments in it. So the one with the black dome and the segments on it, that's the uh, BPS-5 Alpha, the BEEPS-5 Alpha. So one with the black dome on it, that's the ESM uh, direction finder. So it's electronic support measures uh, direction finder. So what that does is it helps refine and then determine the relative bearing of any contact coming in. Once again, it's not gonna find it down a single degree. It's gonna basically narrow it down to a sector, um, uh, but that at least gives you a, a rough direction that you think the radio signal's coming from. Um, then the one slightly closer to it with the flat top. So that's the uh, BRA-19, the BRA-1919. That's a uh, medium and high frequency radio antenna. And then the one back from that with the silver dome. So that's the uh, BIRD 6B. So BRD-6 Bravo. So that detects and determines um, direction of enemy radio radar transmissions, much like uh, the uh, ESM direction finder. Just each one has different strengths and weaknesses depending on which part of the band we're talking about. And then uh, back from that, uh, you've got a mast with kind of like a, uh, uh, it's got an oblong black uh, dome on the top of it. So that's a VLF loop. So that's very low frequency radio. So that way you can uh, uh, receive that. And then you've got, uh, back from that you have the IFF UHF so that's the uh, flat mast 
um, just next to it, the very last one you see uh, sticking up. That's uh, identify friend or foe. Uh, we don't use that all the time because it involves transmitting your position. We would definitely be able to use that in the Cold War for coming into a port. And I wanted to make sure that no one thought that we were potentially an enemy submarine if they didn't have a good, if it's reduced visibility or something like that, and they can't really see us. And then further back from that, so just behind that mast, you can't really see it because it's laid flat. It's not actually raised. That's the snorkel mast or the induction mast. So that's a very flat top in the very back, uh, just forward of what looks at that little wing and just behind that last mast that you can see sticking up. So it's flat with the sail. Uh, that's the uh, snorkel mast. So, all right, with that, I'm gonna go back on and I'll see you all on the bridge. All right, real quick, right before we go up to the bridge, one thing I forgot to show you from the last uh, episode. So these are the running lights. So around the surface, you have to have a running light. A port light is red and a starboard light is green. And these have to be visible from uh, within five degrees of the bow to about 112.5 uh, degrees aft for that arc of visibility. And the way that was done is instead of just having lights built in the side, they would have to send somebody up here, unlock that, rotate the hinge out with a lamp inside of it and the power cord going through back there and then lock it back down and that's how they uh, ran their running lights out while maintaining a streamlined hull nowadays we have uh, looks more like headlights for a car on a modern boat and they uh, will actually um, go uh, they're, they're built into the side it's a plexiglass cover and we just energize them from below we don't have to actually go into the sail to, uh, to turn them on, so. But that's with that one, and that one is the starboard size. That would've been a green lantern in there. That's the port side, this could've been a, a red lantern in there. So with that, on up we go. So as we look back this way, so we'll look, uh, so here's the front of the bridge. We'll come back this way, and as you can see, there's a little wooden stand there and a little wooden stand there. And there's two clamshells uh, or little pockets. Let me see, they're not really clamshells. Uh, that's on a uh, uh, 688 class bridge. But those little po pockets there, you take a bolt and you, uh, uh, or excuse me, you take that bolt there, you take the uh, a wrench, undo it, and that way you can pull that off. And you have a lookout that can stand there and or there and look out either side. So that's what that spot is. Here's the periscope travel. So, back down into there. So that's the number one scope, the attack scope. That's the number two scope. The, uh, excuse me, number two scope, the attack scope, number one scope, the navigation scope. And then you have mass back there. So, let's go over here for a second. This, by the way, that's the hatch that you would normally come out of. So that's the uh, bridge trunk. So that would go all the way down to uh, that hatch that I showed you last episode that goes to the attack center. So that would be the path you come up to uh, avoid that climb that we just did um, where you'd be potentially exposed to uh, uh, the elements. All right, so you gotta remember uh, some of this is done right now. So we have all this up to help prevent birds from flying in making nests back here. Um, and then we're also in the middle of an availability as we're getting ready to uh, do inspections and preservation of the sail area. So uh, this part wouldn't have been here. This would have had wood there just like the uh, um, lookout pukas that I showed earlier. So with that spot there. Um, but as you can see up here, now we're in the bridge and there's actually a lot of room because this would come down and so this area here to give you a size perfection, this is about three feet long here, maybe closer to four feet. It's about two to three feet wide. And that's the clamshell, excuse me, the, uh, the bridge area that you've got. Looking over the side here, so you can see, that's along the starboard side of the ship. We'll talk about the mast in just a second. And that's along the port side of the ship. So that right here, that's the security light added, obviously later, uh, as part of the museum conversion. Okay, so over here, this is that nav, nav ID beacon that I was telling you about. So that's the flashing amber light that would be there. Flash, 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 off. Flash, 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 off, off, off. Then you have the flagstaff here. 
pretty identifiable. It looks like it's gonna hold the flag. That's the emergency whip antenna. That's that thin mass that I was telling you about. Your number one and then your number two periscopes. Your radar mast. Communication mast. So, and then you've got behind that, so that one with the domes, like a bunch of little black spots, uh, some angled uh, pieces of metal on there, all the way up, and then the silver one just behind it. Those are both uh, electronic surveillance, excuse me, electronic support measurements mass and uh, uh, direction finder mass to help identify what communications radar signals are out there. This one just to the right here behind the radar mass, so that's a uh, communications mast. All the way back there, I'm not sure how well you can see it, that's the VLF, so a very low frequency loop. Um, that mask can pick up very low frequency, and then you can't see it too well. But it's a flat mask behind this other one here, um, and that is the uh, uh, identification printer faux mast. Um, and then behind that, flat along the sail, that's the actual uh, uh, snorkel induction mast, but it's flat, so you really can't see anything. So. All right, so in 1957, I talked about this store when we did the uh, wardroom tour. 1957, actually the stateroom tour. 1957, they went to the North Pole, excuse me, under the ice. They didn't actually make it to the North Pole. And while coming up, the number one scope and the number two scope were up, uh, or what, what number one scope was up, number two scope was not, but both of them got bent as they hit an ice flow. Um, and so they had to do some work on the mass to get them to come back up. Number two scope was ruined. The head window was smashed. There was no saving it. Number one scope was just bent backwards. So if they could figure out a way to straighten it, they had a chance of, of making the master turn. Well, they tried using a jack and bracing it off of the sail, but the number, the scope mass is obviously made of steel. The sail, at least at the time, was made of aluminum. And so the jack was destroying the sail, which is already a little bent from uh, some of the, from the ice hit, um, and not the mast. And so they actually braced it off the number two scope since it was broken and used the number two scope to, to jack the number uh, one scope back into position. While doing this, they actually cracked it. So they're sitting here, you can see the area that they're sitting on, right? It's not flat, it's rounded. They're doing their best to jack it and then to weld it shut. Um, and they're above the Arctic Circle. They're in a storm. They can't keep the arc welder lit half the time because it's so cold and windy. And that's what they're up there for hours upon hours fixing this. They finally managed to seal the number one scope, but now they've got an issue because the, the crack there meant that all the pressure went out. And so they had to use, a, uh, use the condensers, which what they used to draw steam down the header to make the turbines go, so keep it in a vacuum. So they used the vacuum and the condenser, ran some tubing up to the uh, attack center, or look, sorry, to the control room, and uh, got into the scope bays that we went into and vacuum dragged the scope uh, so that the inside of it was a vacuum. Then they pressed it with nitrogen. Then they did it again to make sure they got all the possible moisture out of there and filled it with nitrogen again. And the nitrogen is an inert gas. It helps prevent any moisture from forming in there so that you don't have uh, fogging of your optics from the inside, uh, which would destroy your use of the mast. So that's the good uh, sale story we've got. The other one. So in 1966, she was in a collision doing war games. Uh, so she's come to periscope depth and Nautilus had a real problem later in life where uh, she was pretty much deaf as a fence post over about four or five knots and they couldn't hear anything. So they come to periscope depth almost blind um, and they can't hear the aircraft carrier which is pointed straight at them which unfortunately when you have a vessel pointed straight at you creates a bit of a bow null and you, can't, you still can't hear anything. Um, and so Essex is pointing right at them. Essex can't see Nautilus. Nautilus can't see Essex. Nautilus comes to periscope depth just in time to be run over by Essex and Essex took a chunk out of the sail here. Thankfully that was the major damage that was done was to Nautilus and only to the sail. Didn't actually hit the bridge trunk, didn't actually hit um, the uh, any part of the pressure hull so the crew was okay but that was ended up basically cutting the sail open like a tin can. Um, that's the other story I've got for the sail here so okay that's all I've got for that. Hold on a second here. All right, so that's actually going to do it for us here. Uh, this is the last tour in the series, so thanks for coming along. Appreciate you taking the time to learn about Nautilus and the submarine force. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. We'll still continue to answer those. Um, if you have enough of a questions and it warrants another video, we'll go, we'll go shoot a video to help explain wh whatever the question is. Uh, but in the future, we're going to be bringing some new videos, uh, going through some other exhibits that we have, uh, telling the stories that we have at the museum online. 
And then uh, we'll also continue the uh, history uh, series that we've been doing, as well as some of the Medal of Honor uh, series that we've been doing until we're out of the Medal of Honor for the submarine force. So, um, as I said, if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you for coming along. Bye.